Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Hairbrain Games. Today, we're going to take a look at Taiwan Tinsuyu, which is a game about the Incan Empire by David Chertsey. Uh, it basically covers, well, the great Sapa Inca Pacachui turned to his offspring and ordered them to worship the sun god to expand the Incan Empire, which is basically what you're going to do. It's one to four players, about two hours, solo mode included. Let's just get right to the, well, what we're going to do. Okay, let's take a look at what comes with Tawan Tinsio. You get this epic, epic board, very large sized, lots of details and lots of play space. In the center is the sort of the structure that you're going to be building upon as you go down terraces and up to the highest peak here. This is where your priests will go and they can do special things up there. Uh, you also have different areas of the board. This is where the nomads go. This is the city or the village where you can take the uh, to uh, player tokens and use them over time. There are four different uh, gods that you can, or wars, battles, etc., and you'll fight over these. Some will cost you army units that flip over and are out of turn for a while, and others will just frankly kill them off. Um, but each of these has different benefits. Corn, uh, god cards, uh, weavings, tapestries, buildings, just flat out victory points, all of that. And then you have this track, this, t this track here, which is the... Uh, uh, temple track uh, over time you'll have opportunities to ex extend your way up and each time you're going to get victory points at the end of each round that uh, progressively get larger and larger and you're going to get some special bonuses here and some mega bonuses at game end if you get all the way up there that takes a pretty concerted effort each player is going to have a tableau of well let's start out with two resources two units and they'll start with eight god cards three of them are going to be used for play and the other three are going to just simply use for resources for example this means i can just flat out take a gold to start with this means i could take a oh a weaving i could take it from this or the one directly underneath it and there are some rules about how you place them but they get they get pretty interesting we'll go over that later uh, you can get a tater, because everybody locks taters. You can grab a free meeple uh, that might have and colors do different things, so color matters. And then you uh, replace anything. Anytime you go to this horde area, you replace the units. You get, oh, you get a snother stone, and you get a tater, and you get a victory point, which we'll set over there. Everybody starts at 10. We'll bump this baby to 11. And then finally, you get an army card. Army cards are for battle. That's what you're battling for in these four corners of the area. That's a special action as well. And then these are discarded. You, this was a one-time thing at the start of the game, and you are done. And that's what you'll have. And then the other three, they matter. The bottom le matters less so, but the top matters because if you look on the board, you're going to see that these are shapes. And your meeples, your magic special awesome meeple people, can only go where you have a go a card that matches, like there and there. And there are rules as to how much it costs to go along these different areas. Again, we'll go over that later. And gold, you can always play a gold too if you want to just play something somewhere. But gold's pretty precious a commodity, surprisingly not. Uh, each, you'll have uh, stone, corn, taters, and gold. And those are basically your four resources. These are used when you want to mark spots for your, your conquerings. And these are interesting because as you go down these steps, you can build these. And one, it gets you victory points, it gets you special stuff. And anyone that has to use these steps to go down will get a, uh, a benefit in that it costs less for them to place their meeples down here. For example, it normally would cost, say, five. But with these this terrace, it would cost two less, so that would be three. But you, the owner of this, will get a victory point every time they do so. And that's really most of the bulk of it. There's also buildings. Buildings you can build for the top cost. Certain ones, sorry, that's not wrong. There's two types. There's the passive ability types, and then there's the flat-out building resources that you can activate type. And they do different things. And, uh, for example, you can have, if you if you use a space that lets you use your uh, use this action, well, you can get two corn or two potatoes cheap. You can get corn, tater, and three points. This, is an, uh, this one, for example, says that anytime you have a blue meeple, you can treat it like a green meeple and a green meeple like a blue meeple and that's how it goes you're going to play three rounds of this game every player gets a 
player aid and this has a wealth of information that pretty much gives you almost everything you need to know and uh, you know after your first game you're pretty much going to have everything you need to know here with very little reason to go back to the rule book and then of course the uh the awesome solo play mode the auto or axo mama axo mama uh in there and then you get a, the rule book very nicely laid out and every big oh and you get a copy of U boot uh the board game too if you uh order it separately Okay, and that's what we've got. Now let's get into a quick sample of gameplay. Because of the wealth of details in this game, I'm going to go ahead and defer any uh, coherent playthrough uh, from end to end to some of the great resources online already. Uh, I believe John Gets Games and a couple others that I will link to in this video uh, do a great job of really getting down to the nitty gritty. I'm going to give you an overview instead. On a given turn, and players will take turns one by one. They will have their priests already assigned to one of these areas or sectors. The sectors, you'll notice anything that sp spins out kind of goes down here. This is a sector. These spots here form one sector that your priest is at. Anything over here in this quadrant is adjacent and anything back here is not adjacent. Why does that matter? Because the cost in potatoes for doing that is going to vary considerably. Uh, so, say for example we have a turn. There's a lot on the board to process. There's a lot of things going on. A lot of different avenues. You've heard of death by a thousand cuts. This is basically loot boxes by a thousand locations. And it's, 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 uh, it's pretty compelling, but also it, it takes some, some, some definite diffusion of direction as far as your thought processes. Uh, on a turn structure you have opportunities. You can either place a worker, and this is sort of the primary motivation, is to place a worker in a valid spot and then execute actions around it, uh, or s tasks around it, based on where you've placed it. This is the this is sort of the meatiest part of the game. It's sort of the connect the dots or fuse together three different directions of interest. For example, the craftsman, why is it green? Why does it matter? Because if you place this on a green spot, that will give you uh, an additional task. So uh, you get, for example, say I was to move it here. Well, first, I have to pay some potatoes because this is my... I would not have to pay anything to put anything to put the meeple here. But because I'm one adjacent over, I have to pay an adjacency cost of one potato. Goodbye, potato. Now I can use it. But because I placed it on this green part, I get two tasks. That means that around me... Any tasks that I have, I can choose two of them. I can't choose the same one unless I wrap around. Say if I have four tasks and three actions, I can wrap around. But otherwise, I would say grab three potatoes. So I get three potatoes back. That's pretty cool. Time for some potato salad. And that would be one task. The second task would be uh, I could build. I could build a building. Now, why would I do that? Because there's some pretty potent specials here. For example, if I was to give two of those potatoes back and I was to give... A, a stone back, I would qualify to be able to grab a particular building right here. Uh, this one. And that's a nice one because once I use it, or I can get two corn or two potatoes, very versatile. And that is the two tasks that I have performed. That's basically the simplest version of that. Note that if you are adjacent to another colored uh, uh, meeple, for example, say someone was here, you would always get an extra task for every adjacent same colored meeple. And so you can sort of build up some chains of interesting tasks. So anyway, I've done my two tasks. So my next action is I can choose to uh, to to get another meeple from the village. I can either pay a corn for this one, or I can pay a potato for this one, and you'll see that it stretches up. Now in this case, I don't want to do that because I already have two meeples because I actually got an extra one. But if I was down, you, could, you always have to have two at the end of your turn. If you have more, you have to ditch them. So that's basically the scary part. And that's... Oh, 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 oh. I forgot that I had to... Oh, yeah. Sorry here. There we go. Look at that. I forgot that you have to also have a corresponding card to activate this as well. So that's what I missed. So I would have to match that to that in order to have played this at all. Or I could have used my goal. In this case, I'm using my card. When done, I place it here. Once you have one plus the number of players uh, as they stretch out their cards that they use, if you ever get to a certain max, you then flip these over and... 
and start building another run too because other players might might want some of these cards specifically for their own actions so you can grow it out over time and stuff so anyway that's the that's the that's basically the most core thing now if you don't want to place a worker you still have actions moving the high priest also gives you benefits and each one of these is noted rejuvenate for example if i'd use this i could then flip it over uh and then the other thing about these actions is you can use a primary powerful version of it but other, everyone else has an opportunity to play a lesser or more expensive version of that same action. So when you're moving your priest, you're helping everybody or giving the potential to help everybody. Uh, for example, here, you could then, oh, hey, look, I'm going to use, use this to grab my two. And I get to do that for free. Other people would have to pay a cost to be able to use their goods cards. So that's how it goes. And then, for example, this, if in the right circumstances, you can go up the temple... Uh, here you can pay corn to do the same thing and other people get an opportunity to go behind you and use and and also sell at a, at a higher cost or or whatever uh yeah they get a they basically have a more expensive opportunity to try to match you in whatever you do plus there's some other just basic actions if you run out of things to do like praying you get to take two god cards because you're going to get low on these at some point maybe so then you take two god cards that gives you opportunities um and uh, i mean there's a host of things you can do in combat if you wanted to do combat you'd go over here and everybody would well first off you'd kill off a unit that's kind of sad somebody's gonna die somebody has to die and then you play army cards and army cards give you for example um the, the the active person playing it they might play this down everyone else has to pay i think a potato potato to play all their cards and you eventually build up these armies of cards and then when you do that you can use them and follow the rules and say oh i flip one over that gives me that gives me this special bonus everyone else gets a chance to do the same thing the active player could go you know what i'm going to actually use this one I'll actually use this one oh but that kills it so it's discarded but i still get a tapestry and a god card you see how it, it everything kind of builds on everything else in this game uh, through the army cards and uh basically everything else is just that's kind of the bulk of it there's a lot of little details you'll notice that every different color meeple has a little special ability tasks are pretty well laid out the costs are interesting again like if you're if you're building here it's free here it's two and here it, or here it's uh, one and here it's three to build oh sorry here it's free here it's one because it's adjacent and here it would cost three corn or potatoes you'd usually use potatoes and so you have that cost and then you have to add in the this dissension cost so the cost for this terrace is zero the cost for this is two cost is five reduced by how many how many of these uh, staircases you make it, it all blends in a ton of minutia of ways to fix it and if that wasn't enough you also get weavings there's some places where you pick tiles and weave them together you can never have the same pattern in one in a row of your tiles so this would be illegal but you can have all kinds of different ones and the beauty is if you can connect them together resource to resource like this then there are certain points in the game certain actions and when you can when it says hey collect collect for these and you'd get two stone and you'd get a victory point and a gold for stringing these together you can have as many of these as you want you like to string together as much as you can but but uh, that's another option you have. What happens is when the village meeples run out, the village meeple, uh, then you take this festival card and everyone gets one more action. And when it gets back to your turn, you do a festival. Now, festival is kind of like a, like a, just kind of a reset phase. You, you earn some points. Uh, you'll get, uh, yeah, you get to, you get your benefits for certain things like actions. You score victory points for temple work. You you have to pay for each god card some some potatoes, and uh, and then and then you just refill stuff and you keep going on. So you do three of those festivals, and at the end of the third festival, you do the final score. And the end game scoring is fairly similar. You'll get a few different extra bonuses and such, but that's really it. It's basically much ado about everything in that you have a ton of ways and a ton of opportunities. It didn't even go into the totems. You can buy these, and if you buy them, whenever you activate a card with that symbol, say 
this one, uh, you would not only get to activate your meeple, you'd also get whatever benefits are here. Then, later on, you can use this action, and you can trade this in to go up the steps. Oh, I get a potato and a card. I get I get an army card. I get this, and I get four victory points, etc. So, that's basically it in a nutshell. I know this is more of an overview than a playthrough, but there's so much going on here that I do defer to some of the other fantastic videos that really take you step by step through each individual piece of this game. Let's get into my final thoughts and see what I think of Tawantan Seal. Okay, final thoughts on Tawantan Seal, the Inca Empire. First off, it goes through the cons and then the pros. This game is overloaded with iconography, and it will both dazzle and distract you if you are casual in that regard. If you're used to medium to uh, heavy arrows, this is not going to be a problem. If you're not, this is going to look a little daunting. Look a little daunting. This is not uh, turkey and stuffing and some light entertainment kind of game you bring out in between the, the pumpkin and the pie. There are so many input vectors for decision making in this game that you have to consider before you make that move to make your turn. Uh, you have your meeple placement, you have your meeple color placement matching, you have adjacency bonuses, you have multi-step costs based on where how close you are to the top of the pyramid, you've got your uh, priest spatial location cost offsets, you've got army battle tracks on the corners, you've got temple tracks that you're trying to advance on, uh, building specialties that you use, and then you've got passive abilities on other buildings, you've got expendable statue bonuses, and a host of secondary actions of all of those come up short for you. Uh, so be, keep that in mind. Another thing, the calculations on costs, you're constantly calculating, what is this going to cost me again? I'm up and down, I'm left and right. That can be a bit of a crunch for people who aren't naturally desirous of fun mathematical uh, uh, puzzles. Uh, but that's it, let's get to the pros. This is a game that reeks of style. The board is stylish, the pieces are stylish, the art just evokes the time period well. You have an immense amount of visual touches all over the board that make this sort of a fine wallow level background of detail. It's really nice. I love that this is sort of the, this follows sort of the school of Vital Cerda in that uh, you have a handful, a small handful of core choices, and then those choices just explode into shards of opportunistic uh, uh, ramifications and results, um, and you know sort of secondary choices, secondary actions, secondary benefits and boons. Very few of the choices you make have souring consequences. For the most part, you're generally going forwards, rarely backwards. I do like that it does it does at least filter the opportunities uh, well. You have a table of full of choices, this, this uh, you know, all-you-can-eat buffet of choices practically, but you do have limiters set in place in the form of the card and the icon and the meeple color matching or uh, like uh, design matching, pattern matching that you can then use to disseminate at least a starting point uh, for your next move in more rapid fashion. I like that it sort of closes off enough of the board at any given time that it doesn't get too overwhelming to try to contemplate your moves. And it's solo play, as expected from the designer who specializes, is exceptional and interesting at always. So, in summary, in many ways, this is reminiscent of sort of the, the next game up the ladder from Stone Age, I actually think, because it has sort of a similar vibe, there's a you know, vaguely similar vibe, but it's expanded fourfold, and I like it. If you like, hey, Stone Age, oh, we're having fun with it, but is there anything out there that requires more brain power? <laughs> yeah, to one tins you, it will do that. Every year I seem to find some curious surprise of a game that I didn't track, didn't really pay attention to, but that when I played it became a much larger hit than I expected it to be. You know, years ago it was Conquest of Paradise, which came out of nowhere and became my game of the year. Last year, Coimbra was the surprise hit that just became this pleasant experience. To One Tins You is, for me, that game in 2020. Now, despite having a multi-tributary river mouth of choices, there is something 
in this game, the the way that it's wrapped together and the way that it flows, uh, that gives you know, it's got this sort of deitous controlling hand that binds all of those amazing choices together in ways that don't horribly tax the brain power, and I like that. In some ways, for the first few games, I highly suggest that you take the surfer approach and you just make a move, hang out, see the blossoming choices, and ride the wave. That's really a fun way to just start off and playing it, and it'll soon become clear uh, that you can get a little more analytical and a little more uh, detail-oriented, and, and the game excels at that, too. So, honestly, I was surprised and pleased to recommend to Juan Tinsuyu the Inca Empire. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time on Hairbrain Games. Because of the vastness of this game, there's a ton of details. I am going to defer any real uh, tutorial or f like solid playthrough to some of the great online resources that I'm going to um, mark for for uh, blah 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 blah.